Welcome to this edition of the Times Techies webinar series. My name is Sujit John. I usually have with me my colleague Shilpa Fadnis to moderate the discussion, but today both Infosys and Wipro are announcing their third quarter results and uh, Shilpa is busy covering those press conferences and meetings. Today we have with us Professor Sadagopan. Many of you would have heard of him. Some of you may have been students of his. Professor Sadagopan is the founding director of the International Institute of Information Technology, IIIT Bangalore. Under him, IIIT Bangalore has grown to be ranked among the top technical institutions and universities in India. It is focused on postgraduate IT education research. Professor Sadhgopan has been with IIIT Bangalore since its founding. He will be stepping down in June this year after a great career. He has taught for over 25 years at IIT Kanpur, IIM Bangalore, IIT Madras, and IIIT Bangalore. He has had short teaching assignments at Rutgers USA and the Asian Institute of Technology, Bangkok. He has authored seven books. During his tenure with IIITB, Professor Sadhgopan set up the Myanmar International Institute of Information Technology in Mandalay. He has also led a transformational project, a digital identity project called Modular Open Source Identity Platform. This will be an open source version of the equivalent of Aadhaar. This will be initially going live in Morocco and the Philippines, with many other countries expected to follow soon. Welcome, Professor. Always nice to have you. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to have a slightly different format this time. Uh, Professor Sadhgopan has six themes that he wants to address in the course of the next one hour or so. Uh, he would like, uh, each after each theme, he'll stop, and he would like some questions around those, that particular theme. So my request to all of you who are watching this is to set in your uh, uh, questions in the Facebook comments box uh, while he's talking about each of those themes and preferably questions are about that particular theme. Is that fine, Professor? Perfect, perfect. Yeah, okay. Uh, thanks a lot for coming again, uh, Professor. Um, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sujit, and thank you, Vamshi, and thanks, uh, Times of India, for having me this evening. Uh, good evening to everyone logged in on the Facebook uh, channel. I uh, know that uh, webinars have become the order of the day. I'm sure that many youngsters, particularly you all, have been taking a lot of webinars. So it is a nice way to by, by which uh, you can keep up with things and listen to lots and lots of talks. But you also know the other side that there is some amount of webinar fatigue these days because there are too many of them. And uh, sometimes an hour long webinar can be tough. So what Sujit and I have been thinking is that we will slightly change the format. So what we are going to have is I'm going to have six topics and then about five, six minutes each, then we will stop, take a couple of questions, then we keep going. Okay, so that way, I want to make it as interactive as possible. See, one of the not so thing, good things about the webinars is I don't get to see your face. You know, <laughs> now, for many, many years, Times of India and I, we have been doing lots of events together. You know, you have a few hundreds of faces, but you can't see all of them, but at least uh, a few dozens of them in the front row you could see. And that is something which uh, we miss, okay? And thanks, Vamshi, for uh, kind of uh, helping me. So let us kind of go to the next slide. Okay, as we get the next slide, so I think the key message which I want to get across to all of you is uh, computer science has been exciting for many decades. It will continue to be exciting for many more decades. I think that is the key. The second message I want you all to realize is the beauty of computer science, which is a relatively young science compared to the established sciences like the mathematics or physics or chemistry or biology is that this has always been very open. So you're open to new ideas, you work with different people, different professions, different professionals. So constantly enriching uh, the core of computer science is what made computer science so exciting. And that you will actually see more of it in the next 20, 30 years, which will be your prime time for many of you who are logged in here. Okay, so that is the message. So what is that I will talk about today? I will kind of quickly kind of spend a, uh, a few minutes on the computer science over the decades because it is important. And these days you find more and more of the word data science. And some of you might be thinking, 
oh, data science is new, computer science is old. It's actually not true. It is basically the same, you know. And it happens in every other area. It is also happening here. And then the other buzzword called AI and ML, the artificial intelligence and machine learning, deep learning, which you keep hearing all over. So where does it fit into the whole scheme? And then I think I also wanted to use this opportunity to kind of remove some confusion which some of you might have, because you hear a lot of the buzzwords, you know, IoT is a big buzzword, big data is a big buzzword, analytics, data analytics, AI, YAML. And interestingly, robotics is being talked about now. And you normally think of robotics only with a robo, but actually speaking robotics is no longer just limited to robo. There are so many ways in which robotics happen. So we'll talk about that. And then, you know, I think two things which I think is important for youngsters like you who want to look at this one is that CS is going to impact every human endeavor literature to arts, to science, to technology, to education, to health. I think that is important. And I thought that, you know, because a lot of times people are also looking at careers, et cetera. So I think it is important to make you ready for this so that, you know, how do you make use of this opportunity? Okay, so that is how this webinar will go. The next slide, please. Okay, so I will take first topic go for about five to six minutes and it take two questions. And all of you know, we are all the computer science guys, right? They are the C++ guys. So I said, look, it is X++, it is self-incrementing. We go to the next topic, okay? So in fact, Sujit was asking, sir, what is this? Is there a typos? I said, they are not typos, <laughs> but that is how we think, okay? So over to the first slide, okay? So I think this is an important slide for the simple reason that, you know, I don't want to tire you with the uh, history, et cetera. But what is important is that, you know, each one is an important step. See, computing and calculating used to be used synonymously for a lot of time, okay? Calculations are important, but what made the computer go beyond a calculator is its ability to do automatic. You don't have to press the buttons, okay? So you can actually automate it. And more important stuff is it's programmable, so you can change the program. So even, even though it is doing automatically, it will do something for Sujit John, something else for Sharagopan, because the programs are different. And I think we, the engineers, we are the people who are the plumbers, you know, for the last 40, 50 years, what we have managed to do is that we made these things not only work, work reliably. If there is not much of reliability, nobody would have taken us seriously. The reason why we became important is we are super fast. We can do, we can do millions and millions of them. And much more important from an economic point of view for countries like India, it's also affordable. Otherwise, you know, it would just become available to a handful of people. So that is one part of it happened. But I think much more important for many of you youngsters assembled here, because we are looking at the today's IT industry, et cetera. We look at software side. But I think the software side, something interesting, I started using the computer using what is called a machine language and quickly evolved to assembler programming languages. But what is important is, it is the higher levels of abstraction. When we started into computers, we had to learn the tricks of the machine. Today, we want the machine to know your tricks. You don't have to waste your time because the machine will come up to your level of abstraction than you going down to the details of the machine. That is how the Fortran to C, to Java, to Python. And particularly the last, two, I would say, a decade or so, you also see languages like Excel, Macro, and R. What is special about them is anybody can program. You don't have to be a programmer. You don't have to learn. Uh, take a lot of time to learn a programming language. You know, you spend a couple of minutes to a couple of hours, you are there to go and you keep evolving. I think that is something which has happened. And we also kind of changed the, the device itself. Okay, so, you know, we started with the interaction through a card or a tape, then to what is called a dumb terminal, to intelligent terminal, to a PC. And we also introduced some very interesting things. See, most of you take it for granted, right? Some of us actually belong to an era where there was nothing called mouse. Mouse was not invented, right? Mouse was invented somewhere along when we were doing the, our work, right? 
So touch is something which most people saw only in 2007 when Steve Jobs announced the iPhone, right? The pinch and zoom, which you take it so much for granted today, I think, you know, I find that some of the children try to do the pinch and zoom on the television or any other place because they think everywhere else it should work, doesn't, okay? So the tablets, the watch, and today, you know, you have CD from or Apple and you have others, okay? So you are able to speak, you are able to get the vision, okay? But I think the reason why computer science was so interesting is that it kind of start learning from many sciences. It was originally, you know, many of us came to computing from the mathematics because the machines were electronics, so it was electrical engineering. And then you also needed lots of materials, you needed material science. They need to communicate to different subsystems, they were communication. But the shift of computing to data science started happening. I'll give you a couple of examples. See, it is one thing to for the computer to calculate your pay correctly. You want to be guaranteed that you are given the right wage, there are no mistakes. And not only you, maybe 2,000 people working in your factory month after month, but you also want a nice pay slip because you want that to be readable. So pay slip, there's no computation. It is just the numbers, right? But the numbers have to be formatted, printed, maybe annotated, so that it makes sense to you, okay? So what you find is the computation was taken for granted. Your ability to communicate the data becomes much more important. The shift was happening from computing to data. Similarly, we had computers could do draw, drawing and design, but that was nice, but you also wanted it in some form the data coming out in real life. So ability to capture the, all the details of a building and be able to do what is called finite element analysis was important, but was equally, equally important to create drawings, sometimes 2D drawings, sometimes 3D drawings. Nowadays you find beautiful rendering, right? You can actually go and see how the a new structure is going to look like. Maybe a new building is going to look like, you know, we are building an auditorium, but we actually have a walkthrough of the auditorium six months back, okay? And, you know, 3D has come where the data actually becomes real. And you all know, last week, LNT launched a two-story house printed, printed by 3D in 10.6 hours, okay? So things like that are happening. Again, graphics is lots and lots of computing. We do some very interesting 3D work, 2D, solid, mo solid modeling, et cetera. But all these things are interesting, but what is much more important is that it actually impacts the data. You are able to visualize, okay? So you are able to kind of show a 3D stuff, okay? We are able to capture things in a digital camera. And I think all of you know, Slumdog Millionaire was the first and Avatar was perhaps the most famous. These are all movies made completely digital, right? Tons and tons of computers. You need supercomputer, but it is not the supercomputer that is important. It is the visualization data became important, okay? Similarly, MAP uses specialized data structure called spatial data structures. You need the GPS data, lots of computation, okay? But I think for many of you, I think last week, many of you would have gotten into a car and just kind of zoomed around uh, Kurg, et cetera. For you, what matters is Google map. It keeps showing you how to go. And Ola and Uber drivers are able to use it. So mapping is computational, but what you see is actual use by Ola Uber driver. Okay, I think that is where, and of course the DNA sequencing, and particularly these days with the uh, COVID-19 vaccine coming out of Serum Institute, we actually see lots of computation helping the drug design and the business processes have been do, done so well, the invoicing, the order processing. And you actually see, you not only get a ticket for a flight or a cinema, but you also get lots of information. The cinema ticket actually knows which is the location, which is the one, and sometimes something about the movie which you are going to see. One thing is to get access as a simple ticket, but other one is to get lots and lots of information. And of course, last but not the least, the e-commerce, which makes all these things the words of the bytes and the words of the atoms come together, okay? So what you actually see is so much has happened in the last 50 years and made computer science so interesting. And remember, all these things happened because computer science was open to new ideas. Now, if we had said that, look, you know, we don't want to be spending time with the 
Hollywood and the Bollywood guys, we don't understand them. You know, what will they do with the computers? We'll give the computer and let them do whatever they want. Okay, so it won't have worked. We have to sit with them. We have to sit with the movie guys, understand what they do. Then only we could have created it. So during the avatar time, so dozens of computer scientists were actually sitting with the media people for not hours, but days and weeks together. Okay, so this ability to work together with others had made computer science so exciting. Okay, so maybe I'll kind of stop here for a couple of questions in case you have in case you are not warmed up for the questions, no problem. But I think I do want to make it as interactive as possible. Over to you, Vamshi, if there are any questions. Okay, uh, Professor, there's this question from Aryan Pawar. Yeah. Um, uh, the question basically is trying to ask, okay, well, what should uh, one, what should com sci uh, computer science engineering focus on, process yeah. of data or software development? Yes. And my, also the question, uh, um, can you do, let's say just AI or data science without having do, without doing computer science? Okay, so in some sense, it's, it's a very interesting question. See, AI, analytics, data, et cetera, is computer science, you know? So it is nothing, it is not away from computer science, okay? Computer science subsumes all of it. You will actually get to see those things, you know, how the jigsaw puzzle fits in, you will see in my future slides. And much more important stuff is, what is that you should focus? You see, what really happens is, let me give you an interesting analogy. You know, we call it um, carrier content and control theory. You know, it's a very simple notion. So any area as it evolves, the power shifts from carrier to content and then to control. Take the example, there was a time when railroad manufacturing, rail, making railroads was a huge business. You actually see the famous Californian rush, golden rush, was all for making the railroads, okay? But once the railroads are made, the money is not in the railroads, okay? The money is actually in making the trains and move around. And once you make the trains, trains alone are not sufficient. If you're simply going to move the people, you don't necessarily make money. You make money by freight, or you make money by specialized trains. You make money by uh, deluxe trains. You actually have to kind of can't take the content, position it differently. And then of course, then you have rail safety control, standards, etc. The same thing, you know, making airports is only one thing. Making planes and flights is much different. And making very specialized flights, including the so-called the super jet for the rich, you know, so, okay. So similarly, what happens is that if you really look at it, the hardware part of it is more like a career. The software becomes the more of the content, the data becomes more of the content, the software becomes the kind of a control. So in some sense, it's already kind of shifting. You know, there was a time when the IBMs and the HP were the biggest companies, but today it is all the Facebooks and the Googles, okay? So I think, so I think what is important is keep the spirit of computer science together. Computer science will consist of computing, programming, databases, et cetera, et cetera. But much more important is going to be the data and the new ways of doing the data. And far more important is how do you understand? You see, Facebook is actually digital sociology, right? So how do you, and the reason why Facebook is having trouble is sometimes they have not understood what all they have done. If they had done it little carefully, things would have been much better. That's my view, but anyway. But what is important is that it is, okay. computer science consists of AI, ML, data analytics, everything. Okay, so maybe I'll stop okay, here. Do and... data science as a separate thing without understanding, uh, yes. doing a computer science program. Yes. I mean, uh, yeah, you can. Yes, yes. Okay, I think it is important to have the holistic picture, yes. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank there you. are lots of other interesting questions coming in. Uh, there's one from Harish Santanam. Uh, okay. To those who say mechanical, chemical, electrical, et cetera, are evergreen engineering disciplines. Yes. What is your answer as a computer science professional? Oh, see, they will continue to be evergreen. And what you will actually see in the next 10, 20 years is, many of them, okay, would actually be using computers as much as any other person. As a matter of fact, I will even hazard a guess, okay? I think just to make it provocative is that, you know, look at automotive engineering. The number of people who are designing automobiles is much larger, but the automobile industry is far, far much higher. So similarly, the number of people who will be actually designing computers, even today it is happening, the number of people who write operating system is in dozens and hundreds. Okay, but the programmers who are using enterprise software are in millions. 
So in a sense, okay, computer science is not going to be separate. You know, there will be a small number of people who will actually focus on it. But I think the financial analysts, the mechanical engineers, the chemical engineers, they will start using computers. In fact, already biology people are using more computers than mechanical engineers today. Okay, so that I is how we can send on that, no? Yes. Okay. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So maybe what we will do is we will uh, go to the next slide and take up some more questions. Okay. Okay. Bansi. Okay. The next one. Okay. So this is something which I want you to kind of uh, take a look at it because this will also kind of answer uh, uh, some of the questions. So what happens is that, you know, sometimes people ask our ask us question, sir, what is your core competence? I jokingly tell them that, look, my core competence is I can add and multiply large number of zeros and ones, large, really large, millions and hundreds of millions, sometimes billions. More important stuff is I will not make mistakes and accurately I will do, and I will do it fast. You know, I won't make you go to sleep, okay? So the ability to do this. Second, I will be able to store and retrieve significantly large number of zeros and ones. Once again, I will do it real fast. Much more important is accurate. When you ask me for your bank balance, I will definitely give you only your bank balance and not mine or Sujit's, right? It's important, right? So we need to get exactly the right data. And of course, much more important is, I will push the data anywhere in the planet. Maybe even if you go to moon, you will be able to get it. So we will move things at the speed of light, okay? So move zeros and ones, okay? So this ability to compute, communicate, store, and retrieve data is now at the core of computing science, okay? So it is not, see, it is important to have processors, it is important to have or programs, etc. But I think the shift is actually happening to the data. And much more important, so accuracy is important, reliability is important, speed is important, connectivity is important, cost is important. And I think one of the great things which uh, Microsoft proved was ease of use of interaction was important. You know, until Windows came, and of course Steve Jobs, Apple had this operating graphical user interface, computers were difficult to use. They were actually for we guys, the programmers, right? You know, or the computer engineers, they're hard to code. But I think what has happened is that once computers are available, I think lots and lots of creative computer scientists started working with others and started processing, just not numbers. You see, whenever you think of computer or computing or calculating, you think of numbers. Inside the, com inside the computer, what is stored is only numbers. And because they are digital computers, what you will find is only zeros and ones, nothing else. But these zeros and ones are not simple zeros and ones. So when you see Sujit John's picture on the screen, it's a beautiful picture. But if you actually go into the computer memory, you will find only zeros and ones. Okay, somewhere along the beauty of a human face is codified with those numbers, okay? Similarly, a beautiful book, okay, is an amazing text, you know. So you actually have collected works of Swami Vivekananda. Yesterday, Swami Vivekananda's birthday was there, right? So some 23 volumes, amazing amount of text, but inside the computer is still zeros and ones. So pictures, text, and much more important, you have, you know, I'm sure all of you use, um, computer audio, right? You listen to music, you know, whichever music you like. And, uh, you know, Apple, I think possibly even still sell something called iPods. And good old days, we used to have Sony Walkman. They were all the audio players, right? But audio is also stored, but nothing but zeros and one. Okay. And more interesting, video is also stored as zeros and ones. And this is where the digitization actually started happening. And then in the process, we created a new economic category called a digital goods, right? So what happens is today you all see that there is something called Kindle, right? On Kindle, you can buy a book, but a book does not come in the form of physical form, right? It directly comes into the device, you are able to read. 
So that book is a digital book. You know, in economics, we talk about good and services, right? Goods and services, GST, right? So all about goods and services. But it normally you associate goods with a physical form, services with a non-physical form. I think we guys have confused you, right? Because we are able to create a digital good. I can actually create a beautiful album, marriage album, wedding album, but it need not be in physical form. It could be the form of uh, a beautiful digital thing. And of course, to add to the more confusion these days, you know, you all see there are so many medical images, good old days there used to be X-ray and then ultrasound came, ultrasound was one of the first. And then many of you know something called CT scan, the tomography, they're all inherently digital. MRI is digital. So what happened? All the medical images are all digital. So you will actually have a locker where you can keep all your data. So today you have a hard time keeping track of all your data. So you can keep it. So the drawings and the maps. So what we did was that um, we created a way of capturing all these forms digitally. In the process, we created a digital economy. And how many of you remember the, when was the last time you went to your bank? Right? You don't have to go to the bank most of the time. You do banking, okay? But you don't have to go to the bank because banks have become completely digital. And particularly in this country, we have done our job great. You know, companies like NPCI and UPI have done some amazing stuff. So what is happening is that, you know, you know, a country which did not have enough ATMs ended up having Paytm, right? Okay. <laughs> so, you know, you know, Google Pay, now Apple, uh, WhatsApp Pay, Phone Pay, you know. So, so what you have is, okay, so the, the entire money has become completely digital. And of course, you all know that uh, when you kind of cross uh, a particular state and then there is a particular toll booth, you no longer pay cash, right? It's automatically debited to your account, right? So thanks to uh, technology. So what is actually happening is the entire, even though we at the core of computers is all numbers, but these numbers don't remain simple numbers. It, it is a picture, an audio, a video, a drawing, maps, and then of course DNA sequences, you keep adding, okay? Lots and lots of them are getting added. And this is the time when people started using the term called IT, the information technology, okay? Some people like it, some people don't like it, but you know, it's quite widely used, okay? The computers and communication together. In Europe, they actually use something which I actually personally like, they use a term called informatics, okay? So instead of computer science, they use a term called informatics because they say, okay, computer science is all about information. That means, you know, much before the word data science, they have been using the word informatics. Some of you should actually go and take a look at this book. This was a 1987 book, quite old. Many of you, I'm sure most of you in this would not have been born by that time, okay? And so it talked about a trillion dollar opportunity Okay, way back in 1987, when it, the IT industry was just a couple of billions. Okay, nobody thought that there will be a thousand fold uh, increase. It's already happened, right? You know, and uh, you know, we expect that even when India becomes a five trillion economy, we expect IT to be a trillion dollar right in, in this country. Okay, so that is the growth. Okay, and that is the one which made computer science so interesting. That is the reason why so many of you are logged in today, right? So many jobs, so many companies, so much wealth, and you know, so much prosperity and so many opportunities and so many new startups. All these things became possible, I think, simply because the shift moved from simply storing zeros and ones, but doing it so well to do so many things. So essentially, computer center became a data center and computer science becomes a data science. So don't think that computer science and data science are two different things. It is just a question of shift in the emphasis. Okay, maybe I'll stop here and take some questions. Yeah, so there's a related question um, yes. along what you just said. Um, this is from um, Jagannath and Gopalakrishnan. Sir, would the future of computer science fragment into specialized courses like AI ML at the UG level? Okay, uh, Jagannathan, so you seem to have a very, very deep and interesting question. Okay, so honestly speaking, the answer is I don't know, because I should be honest. Okay, but you see, I tell you, I think I had uh, given a talk where I had actually 
gone on record saying that will AI be called AI maybe 20 years from now? I personally feel it will not be. Okay, so let me give a quick example. So if you kind of go back in history about 300 years back, some small thing happened, somebody called James Watt in UK created something called steam engine. Right? I think a couple of people created even before that. Okay, so that happened in mechanical engine happened, because steam engine happened. And then somewhere in Germany, diesel essentially created something called an internal combustion engine. You know, that is what the one which you find in most cars. Okay. And then somewhere in the eastern coast of United States in a town called Edison, a gentle, of course, the name Edison happened later, but the gentleman was Edison. The city got named later, okay, and created something called electricity. So these three things coming together created something called engine, which can actually kind of convert a brown power into an automated one. So you no longer need to have maybe um, animals to create more bond power or human beings only for a brown power, right? So essentially what happened was you had a brown power accelerator, right? Something that can accelerate the physical power. And look at what all it created. It created cars and planes where you can move. It created elevators where you can go up and down, okay? It created pumps so that you can pump water to any place, you know, you don't have to go near the river to set up a shop. You can set up a home anywhere and water will come to you because I can pump it. And you can take water throughout your homes. And then sophistication, sophistication, you have very specialized pumps, which will actually be a substitute for a heart because you realize heart is also a pump. But at the core is something called engine. In so many forms, it manifested itself and created something called engineering as a profession and a professional called engineer to which I belong to, right? But this did not happen overnight. It happened over a period of time, okay? Something similar is just happening now, right before our eyes. My feeling is it will take decades to evolve, if not centuries. And so instead of brown power acceleration, we are seeing brain power acceleration, okay? Because of historic reason, it is called artificial intelligence. I just don't like this word because I think there's nothing artificial about it. And at this point in time, it is not too intelligent because they are too dumb. So I would like them to be far more intelligent, but there will be a new profession. There will be a new professional. What it will be, I don't know. I'm sorry for a long answer to your short yeah. question. There are lots of questions coming in. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. So we'll take, yeah. you can take, yeah. I, 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 okay, before your next one, let me take, uh, ask you this. Hari Narayan is asking, sir, I feel there is a lot of hype in AI ML in, in India among students. Yes. I feel that even though there are a lot of problems in India which can leverage techniques from AI, uh, there is a lack of quality AI researchers in India which is limited to top IITs. As students from a computer science background, is doing a specialized degree in AI from a top school the only way to be fully equipped with the current techniques and prepare for the future in AI? Okay, excellent question once again. That yes, you know, like because AI is too new and relatively. And second thing is, you know, uh, okay, let me also explain. I think this is a very nice stuff. You know, if you get a chance, you should read this book by Kartik Hosanagar. Just note it down. Kartik Hosanagar, you can go on Google. He teaches at Watson. He's a, a Mandi Namaga. He's a Bangalore boy. And he puts a very nice thing. It is called uh, uh, Nature and Nurture. You know, when you are talking of a plant, etc. So there are two parts to it, right? There's a plant which is very good, which is very strong. So you put it because the plant or the seed is so good, it sprouts. But there is also the nurture part, you know, how much sunlight it gets, how much water it gets, how much care it gets, how much fertilizers it gets. Okay. But what you actually see, the health of a plant is a combination of nature and nurture. Okay. So AI has two parts. One is algorithms and data. So algorithms is more like a nature and data is more like a nurture. And we actually all used to do AI in 60s and 70s, but we just couldn't, I think uh, many people do not know, many of the youngsters do not know. We formally declared in 60s the winter for AI. <laughs> 50s was the spring for AI because simply we did not have access to data. Data. But now with far more, so it's a data-driven AI is the one which makes it interesting, okay? So going back to your question, so because what is happening is access to significantly large amount of data, and when you have significantly large amount of data, you also need the right tools. 
So those kind of stuff are available only to the premier researchers and premier institutes, et cetera. They are not widely available. Second thing is there is not enough written about it because you know algorithms are happening every month, new algorithms are happening, new conferences are happening, new papers are happening. So it will take another 10 years before many of them will be written down in the form of a nice textbooks, et cetera, so that it can be taught by a large number of people. Okay, so that will problem. So at this point in time, yes, but don't worry because not everyone has to understand all of it. And I'll come back to you in again in my slides also. I think learn something really well. Does not matter what you learn. But simply saying, I know 200 things is not going to make you any, take you anywhere. But you take two things and you should say, I know it better than anyone else in the planet. Okay, what it is does not matter. Okay, so I think that is going to be the core. The next 10 years, 20 years, it is going to be for the people who know something really well. And it could be across the computer science of so much of it, you don't have to do an AI ML program. And within computer science, there is NFE start and lots of things are available. And if you cut the core of AI ML also, much of it is nice mathematics and statistics and probability and linear algebra. So learn probability well, learn mathematics well. I'm not saying you have to learn every part of mathematics, but at least the core parts of mathematics, which you have to learn, learn it well. There is something called mathematics of AI. Learn that well. Statistics of AI, you don't have to learn all of statistics, but you have to learn the core statistics for AI. Similarly, you have to learn good linear algebra and good abstraction. And if you have it, it does not matter whether you learn it to go to the, the top schools or not, but you can still Benefit from there must be benefit. Uh, uh, relatively, uh, I mean, free or relatively low cost online resources as well, isn't it? There are lots of zero cost courses. Mm -hmm. Why low cost? Zero cost courses. Lots of things are available. But I think what is not easy for people is you need a discipline. Okay. So today you can actually be what is called the famous, you know, child in a uh, what is called the toy store because you are too many things you get confused. So I think once again, it does not matter what, take one or two of them, spend time, go deep, okay? So it does not matter from which course or with Coursera or edX or whatever you learn, but I think learn it well. I think that is again, learning it well is going to be more important than what you learn. Okay, there are a lot of questions, uh, but uh, okay, third, we'll go to the third session. And I then think we should go to the next slide. Yes, because we are already 40 minutes. Okay, so 35 minutes, yeah. Okay, so this is again, okay, this actually answers uh, some of the questions which some of you even had. What is the core of AI and machine learning? Okay, so what really happens is something like that, you know. See, as we get more and more of data, so initial days, we were actually worried about how do you process the data? You know, early days, when you bank, you have millions of bank account, bank customers' records. How do you keep the records very well it was important. And then how do you issue tickets, maybe for Indian railway reservation, right? You have 11,000 trains every day carrying millions of passengers, you know, multiple times a day. So how do you kind of keep track of the data? That was the big data problem. But actually speaking, that problem is kind of pretty much solved. But now something very interesting. You book a ticket, book a seat in a, in a cinema hall, or book a ticket for a train, you print a ticket, collect the fee, the process is over. But some smart fellows ask the question, okay, when you are doing it week after week, can you not detect patterns? Can you not find out this particular movie in this particular movie hall is not doing well? Okay, maybe you can actually shut it down and maybe kind of, there are only one 12 fellows for 20 fellows, you don't have to run it, maybe you can actually give them that look, you know, if you're willing to go to other movie hall next door, we'll refund you the half the money, then people will happily go, right? So I'm just giving one example. Like that, you can actually detect patterns, okay? So many of you would have seen that railways introduced after many years of tra railway reservation, something called, uh, I'm just trying to kind of get it name, you know, reservation against cancellation, REAC, okay? So REAC essentially came because they found that typically, okay, about one sixth or one seventh of the time, people don't show up, okay? So if you actually have a seat, which is flexibly made available, you can actually accommodate all of them. So that is a pattern. 
So that pattern, how did they get the pattern? You know, partly intuition, partly analysis, partly asking the right questions. We'll come back to that. Much more interesting, you see a lot of patterns. From these patterns, can you make even a trend? Going back to the example, you know, railways did something very interesting. You know, I think COVID has actually allowed lots of people to independently think, sit and think. And because there is not too much of people are busy, so you could quietly get something through. Lots and lots of trains were running with very few passengers. Railways have rationalized lots of trains in the last one year during the COVID time. Because, you know, some of these things can become a little controversial, etc. But I think what happened, these are trends. You are not really talking of pattern between Monday to Tuesday to this week to this week. But you are looking at trends which are happening over months and weeks and years. Okay, how do you get those trends? Okay, so this is at the core of data analysis. And more interesting stuff is we want the machines to do it themselves. Because there was a time where you had analysts to do the analysis, but analysts are hundreds or thousands or hundred thousands in numbers. But analysis, which you have to do, is in millions and millions. If you have to wait for the analysts, lots of analysis will never be done. Can the machines do? detecting the patterns and detecting the trends automatically, okay? So that is what drives today's AI and ML. So I'm just giving a couple of examples, okay? So many of you would have seen that, uh, you know, when you use a Google and a Gmail, okay, as you compose, it keeps suggesting a few things, right? And I think you got a mail, said, look, can we make it at 9.30, okay? So as soon as you open it, it will say yes or no. It will give you an option, right? So things like that are actually happening. And many of you might have used a tool called Grammarly, okay, which actually checks the grammar as you keep typing the mail text, okay? And of course, can machines translate? I, I don't know how many of you use Google Translate, you know? It translates fairly well, okay? And translation is a job of detecting patterns. Okay, so that is how we actually translate. So we are actually able to do. And then, in fact, uh, our uh, friend, um, Dr. Devi Shetty keeps talking about how computers can actually do better than the doctors, et cetera, because they say that, look, you know, a lot of times you are actually a subservient or slave to the uh, tools, right? You get so many reports and most of the time what the doctor does is he goes through the report and based on the report, he's actually able to de decide a particular pattern. This can actually be done by machines. And, uh, you know, there were lots of attempts, uh, John Hopkins in US and even Manipal Hospital tried with IBM. So it's all evolving. I'm not saying it will completely happen, but a few things are already happening, right? Traffic offenders are caught by cameras and issue tickets, right? So earlier we wouldn't have thought that it is possible, but you know, it is possible right in this country, right in Bangalore, Okay, right, partly manual, partly automatic is happening, okay? So people are really looking at, you know, you know we keep having these financial frauds, et cetera. Can machines detect before the frauds happen? Okay, and it may be instructive for many of you to actually read this just about a four months old article. This actually was an editorial and Guardian, and of course our friends from media would love it, right? So there is an article, the title of the article is, a robot wrote this entire article. Are you scared, human? <laughs> okay. This uses a program called GPT-3, okay? So in a sense, you, computers can write poetry, write text, write editorials, write news. Sometimes one has to be very careful because we don't want it to write fake news, okay? <laughs> and of course, the question which we ask is, can, if you kind of keep running it a couple of more steps, can it replace, you know, you and me? So can a robo be sitting in the place where Sujit John is sitting and the place where I am sitting, that could be another robo. And then, you know, can we actually give, can the two robos be giving this webinar? Or to just to kind of ensure that you guys are not sleeping. So are you sure that we are not robos? Maybe we are already. Okay. <laughs> we are not human. We are just faking to be human beings. Anyway, so I think this is, Okay, so now you get an idea where computer science is getting driven. So you will find 
that it opens up significantly large opportunities. You know, you don't look at machine language, translation, processing, et cetera, traditionally with computers. You normally think, you know, you go to English department, you go to language department, Canada department, you learn a grammar, you learn translation. And, you know, when the dignitaries come from outside the country, you need a translator. So typically those translators would have gone to, uh, would have done an MA in English literature or MA in German, et cetera. Computers are getting into this. And nobody thought that uh, doctors and computers will work so much together. And nobody thought police fellows and fintech fellows will work with the computers. But I think what is actually happening is it is actually getting to the core of human endeavor. Maybe what I will do is I will go to the next slide, complete it, and then take up the question. Maybe that would probably, uh, yes. Okay. So I think. Some of you, I anticipate some of the questions is that, you know, you keep asking, you know, should we do only AI or should we do, or should we do computer science? Okay, look at this as a continuum. I just put about half a dozen acronyms that could be others also. So what is happening is the internet of things is IOT. Once again, I think people will come up with something better than that because IOT doesn't make sense to me. Okay, internet of things, you know, but what people realize is if there is a CCTV, which is isolated, which is CCTV, but if it is connected on the internet, which I can control from anywhere, which I can read from anywhere, it actually becomes an internet connected device. Instead of internet connected computer, it actually becomes internet connected things. It could come in so many forms, okay? So we have IOT, and then you find a lot of jobs, you know, descriptions, et cetera, about big data because IoT will lead to big data. Then you have analytics, then you have AIML, then you have robotics. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I call it as a continuum is, see, when we actually started, you know, we actually built the, um, the email was originally built so that the system analysts or the system administrators could actually kind of talk to other system administrators. So we built it for that. Then later on, others also got in, so suddenly, Email was meant to just connect computers, but it connected people. Once people got connected, lots of interesting things happened. So when everybody was started using email, they said, oh boy, there is so much data of the email. Okay, compared to the programs, this was much larger. But when Facebook came, so suddenly we found that people are not just emailing, but they're also posting WhatsApp came, et cetera. The messages was much larger than the mail. So this, the definition of a big data kept changing. But I think we will see a much larger amount of big data when the IoT is around. Because IoT will be, computers are hundreds to millions. And you know, some of you, the youngsters, you will be interested just for fun to tell you, know, tell you that uh, in late 60s, we were actually counting the number of computers in the country. We stopped counting only when we crossed 200. Okay, so country had 200 computers, which you can count. So that is how things were, right? So millions of smartphones are from billions. Now there are six and a half billion smartphones. IoT will be hundreds of billions of them because cameras will be IoT, thermometers will be IoT. And remember, they will keep measuring every 10 minutes, every one minute, every fourth minute. And every one of your watch is an IoT. So it will keep kind of somewhere publishing your weight data, your heart data, multiple times an hour, multiple times a minute weighing machines, rain gauges, air quality meters, electricity meters, okay? So the big data tomorrow will be much bigger than all of the data today. And obviously, without analytics, you can't do analysis. That's where you would need map and stat. But analysis cannot be done by human beings. It has to get automated. That is where the AI and AML come. And robotics is basically, you see, all these things you normally associate only with the world of bytes, because you know they're all data. But now you have a physical world, what we call the world of atoms. The world of atoms and the world of bytes are coming together in the form of robotics, okay? And don't think of robotics as an industrial robot, does not have to look different. And you know, my famous example is, you know, a small town called Karur, which is not even a tier two town, it's a tier four town. There's a small Karur Vaishya Bank, where there is an assistant which will actually uh, do lots of banking for you, okay? And it actually wears a sari, okay? It's a lady looking, okay?
okay it's a female robot so what i'm saying is the idea is to break the traditional notion of a robot right and there is something called uh, uh, robotic process automation you know how many of you use uh, a big basket you know when the big basket when you have to complain you just go and type half the time it is not human being who type talking to you it is actually a robotic process automation so what is happening is when the robotic process automation comes so you will have connected cars you will have drones we will have driverless cars and all these things are part of extra, because all of them use ai all of them use computers okay so in a sense if you all put it all together it is a much larger world in this much larger world the opportunities are also much larger maybe i'll stop here and take some questions okay this is a question on uh, i mean use of ai and all that in the computer science education itself it's from harshada shankar pawar okay um, how will teaching computer science change we have seen a lot of education tech focused on computer science and other courses right thinking about real time assessments and feedback how will the yes. teaching faculty use technologies to provide customized real time feedback especially on longer and more involved programming code assessment okay uh have and what efforts have been made on working on this part okay excellent question so i'm glad that somebody is thinking of these things you see i think covid we should give credit to covid it also forced us to think of a few things which we have probably not really done okay so first question is assessing code is something which you know there is a group at tifr which became ncst later on even in the early 70s had tools to automatically assess the code in fact it used to be create a problem you know like people who uh, their admission test was actually to write a code which will be actually assessed by a computer itself you know people used to have a lot of fun but you know it could do only so much but over the years lots of tools are available to actually uh, kind of automatically grade your code and i tell you something very interesting for particularly for youngster see normally you hate exams you hate uh, homeworks you hate assignments you know etc but what happens is if you do it well we actually have seen that inside triple it we have done it so there is actual tool which not only grades your program but actually kind of gives you a lot of feedback so good old days when we had a smaller number of students when i had 30 students i remember in 70s and 80s when i used to be active teaching so okay people used to love my exam because at the end of the exam i will give them a very detailed feedback you know i will write on the answer book you got this right you got it this is where you got wrong etc etc and for 30 of them you could do it and people found it was very valuable because even people who did not make the grade they were happy because they got the few uh, inputs that once we have grown you know we have gone into hundreds of students etc those things have become difficult so again it is coming back thanks to the tools we are able to give a lot of feedback so the result sometimes now we find some of the students actually want to take more tests <laughs> okay because they find that they are able to do it okay the larger question is are we able to do analytics yes i'll tell you one interesting analytics which we have found normally we used to have the philosophy that when you scale when you increase the quantity the quality will suffer okay it is actually true in the normal one when you have a 30 students and you have 300 students okay the level of intimacy the level of interaction we could have in a class dramatically comes down you know but in online it is not true and we have found something very interesting normally in a one hour one and a half hour class we are able to take out four or six maximum six questions but in online we are able to take on an average about 10 questions because one is lot of people hesitate to ask question when everybody is around but online actually gives them the protection they ask question second thing is you don't have to answer immediately because you can answer it little later because you have some time you are able to do it so online kind of improves okay and the second thing is we also find that you see some of us are personally convinced now post covid that from 2021 22 onwards okay the higher education particularly i don't know about the school education will be actually different because the, the notion of an online education and face to face education as two different things will not stay they will get seamlessly matched because we have already started some of my colleagues they find that you know one hour webinar is can be very boring for the students so what they do they actually deliver this you know even the one which i am using this format is about what i learned from them they put some 5 minutes 10 minutes short videos 
put it one day before, ask them to go through. First to five minutes, they say, look, anybody has question with the first part. So they are actually not lecturing at that time because they find it's a much better form of using this. So even the regular classes, we will start using that. I take this normal example, you know, in the e-commerce world, now slowly what is happening is the buying from the store and by online buying is not going to be different because I think all of us will buy a few things online, few things we will go to shop. And then Walmart will also have an e-presence, Amazon will also have a store, okay? So I think it is similarly online and face-to-face -face is actually going to be used together. In some cases, it becomes 50-50. In some cases, it becomes 90-10. Some cases, it becomes 10-90. It will contextual. Last question which you asked is, can you do a personalized one? I think this is the real power of online. You know, you could have, you know, my good friend, Professor C.K. Prahlad used to talk of mass customization. So can you offer a program where every student is given care and attention, okay? And online actually offers that opportunity. You could actually make every student take a slightly different path because monitoring that is done by machine. So earlier, the biggest problem was if I have hundred students doing hundred different things, how do I monitor it? That used to be the problem. Today, you don't have to monitor, the machines will monitor. Okay, so in a sense, it is possible today. Okay, but are we fully ready? We are not, we are still learning, but it will evolve over the next couple of years. But what I find is that we might be in a position to offer individualized, customized, personalized learning for every student. And that is what excites me from an online point of view. Sorry, we are running late, but I think uh, this part of- This is a very basic question from Hossein. Um, you spoke yes. about coding as a core competence. How can we improve yeah. our coding skills? And I just okay. wanted to ask you, uh, this question of math keeps coming. Uh, I mean, how important is yeah. math now in um, all that? How important is? Ma mathematics in- oh, so Shall we take it? Oh yeah, okay. See, I tell you. But the first question math is coding is important. now, Professor. Okay. Yeah, see, see, coding is important, but let us also not get confused, okay? So what is happening is if people are telling you that, look, you start coding at the age of three, you will become Mark Zuckerberg. It is nothing but nonsense. Okay. <laughs> Just don't believe that. Okay. That's not going to happen. Coding is not computer science. Okay. So touching the telescope does not make you a particle physicist. Okay. So don't mix up tools with this. Okay. Okay. First. Okay. But coding is an important part. See, coding is a way by which you are able to abstract an idea. Coding is the way by which you are able to abstract algorithms. Algorithms are nice recipes, right? So coding is important, okay? But once again, what do you code is not important. How well you code is important, right? And second thing is that uh, certain shallow level mistakes you should not do. You simply should not think, if you know Kannada Gotilla, you don't become a Kannadiga. Right? Just because you know some smuttering of a few Canada sentences does not make you a Canadiga or make an expert in Canada language, literature, etc. But Canada is important. If you can speak a few sentences, if you can pick up, you can converse in Canada, etc. Important. But the concept of Canada, the concept of Canada culture, Canada literature, etc., takes years, if not decades, to master and understand. Okay. So similarly, coding is just introductory level okay and you probably should also know there are outstanding computer science people okay who may never code you don't have to code to be a computer scientist because they ask questions like what problems are computable are there some problems which are never going to be analyzed ever by a computer because they are not inherently computable and there are some problems which can be provably hard that they are not only i can't solve it you can't solve it no one else in the planet can solve it today tomorrow day after Okay, so those are far more interesting questions than coding. Okay, so coding is important, but don't over glorify coding. Second thing is coding is not computer science. Okay, coding is one part of computer science. You know, it's not that, you know, yes, you know, a lot of times to get things done, we use coding, but you know, but don't mistake that, you know, it is something like that. Okay, you, okay, when somebody from the other planet comes and looks at all of us, he or she should not think, if you don't drive, you can't be a human being. It's not true. We all drive, but you can be a human being without ever driving your car yourself, right? So I think you have to be very careful in not making those shallow mistakes.
Okay. Uh, but so I hope I am how can we question. improve coding skills? I mean, but coding is essential. You would agree? Oh, okay. it's improve. Yeah, coding. Okay, improve coding skills. Are some first and foremost is that you know. Okay, depending on the path. Okay, some people who are actually competition oriented. There are lots and lots of competition. The ultimate is what is called ACM programming contest. Okay, which is okay. The world's um, the most difficult one. Okay, so you start. Okay, there are now smaller coding or programming Olympiads, etc. Start that, and then both the Triple IT Delhi, Triple IT, uh, Triple IT Hyderabad, IIT Delhi, Triple IT Bangalore. So we have been having for years now winners. So you could kind of talk to us. We could kind of guide us. Okay, so that is at one level. The second thing is there are people who actually don't really look at from a competition point of view, but you just want to have a mastery. Okay. So there are lots of courses available which you can take. Much more important than one is you actually take a particular domain. So supposing you know you are a biology person, so you could take biology. So you essentially start looking at what does bio coding means for a biology. If you are a financial person, you actually look at what coding means for a fintech person or a finance person. And you could be a real estate person. There is a lot of coding for real estate, something to do with a lot of AR and VR, et cetera, et cetera. You could be a health person. You could be a doctor. You could be a nurse. So what does coding do for a health worker or a health professional or a doctor or a medical person? OK, so lots of these things are available. So take one of them. But you see, you can't be a coder for everybody. That's not going to be possible, right? It is something like, can you speak all the languages in the planet? Okay, I'm not saying it is impossible, you know, like we had Narsim Rao could speak 14 languages, but you know, but it's amazing, but you, but probably even he could do only 14, he can't do 14,000, right? But because you can you, transition you from healthcare to, can you hand, yes. transition from healthcare to banking and all that uh, fairly easily? Yes, yes. It's, it's, you see, it's not that easy. So one has to be careful about it. So I think you take a domain and then excel in that domain and start coding for that domain. And okay. lots of tools are available today. Most of them are free. Okay. Yeah. So there, there, there's this okay. question. So uh, I think we seem to have run out of time. Yeah. So I think Vamsi, you have to tell us what should we do. So we have time. Um, I okay. think there are enough uh, people still asking questions. Um, uh, any addresses? Moshmi Mazumdar is asking how important is mathematics in computer science? Oh, okay. So mathematics is very important. So that's no doubt about it because you see, because what is happening is particularly with the AI coming. So you see, what is actually happening is that one, let me also tell you where you have to be careful. Because machines are fast, machines can process a lot of data, machines are far more capable, you have lots and lots of memory available. Machines can also create a lot of junk. Okay, so when there is too much junk generated, okay, so you ought to have a way of keeping yourself out of the junk and getting to the core. Okay, that is where mathematics comes in handy because mathematics is a way of by which you can abstract things much better in a far more precise way. So I'm not saying you have to, you have to be a super mathematician, okay? But you ought to have something called a functional level of mathematics. That is where I said, go and Google what is called mathematics for AI. So what, what are the mathematics part which you need? Because if you don't have it, you will probably get into the problem. The machines will actually end up fooling you. But you know, finally, when you make a presentation to your boss, the boss is not going to fire the machine, but he's going to, he or she is going to fire you. So you have to be careful. So mathematics ensures that you know the context and uh, you actually have a way of it. Second thing is that mathematics teaches you how to ask the right questions. So you don't have to know the answer. The computer will find the answer but it is far more important for you to ask the right questions because if you don't know how to ask the right questions, whatever answers you get, you start believing in them. That is the second. Third is that you also need rigor. See, one of the stuff is that, you know, particularly you would have seen the fake news kind of a case. So anything is correlated to everything, okay? So possibly you might get confused between some, some amount of correlation with causality, okay? It so happened that, you know, Two things happen together. It does not mean that one implies the other, right? And those kind of mistakes which you keep happening because you don't have the rigor. So mathematics gives you the rigor. Or you know, to put it in a typical statistician's way, we actually say that look, you make what is called 
the null hypothesis. You make a hypothesis and use the data to prove that the hypothesis is wrong. So then, and to make the hypothesis, you actually would have to know something. You can't ask anything can be a hypothesis, okay? So what you do is you ask, that is part of asking the right question. And use the data, use the mathematics, use the analysis, use the computers to prove or disprove whether null, null hypothesis is true. Then you actually have a real analysis which will have some value, which will, which will not only please your boss, which will also please the company and the planet. Okay, thank you. Okay, Professor, we have a little time. There are three more questions at least. Can sure. we take that? Um, and I have no can... problem. I have no yeah. problem. You see, professors have no problem answering questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is from Mahesh. Um, yeah. Has computer science been an, an anomaly from other branches in terms of importance of UG versus PG? Is there value in pursuing MTech in computer science if we don't want to go into the research field? Okay, so very interesting question. You know, see, okay, people pursue masters for two things, right? So you actually want to do a different set of jobs than compared to what you do with an undergraduate degree. And a master's is also preparation for a PhD, okay? Okay, both options are there, okay? But historically in our time, when research was primarily conducted by academic institutes and research institutes, Okay, so MTech and a PhD and typically a teaching or a postdoc or a research job used to be a one career. But I think what particularly has happening in the last two, maybe 30, 40 years, more so in computer science, a lot of research happens in corporate labs. The Google research lab or the Facebook research lab employs as uh, cutting edge researchers, you know, some of the best professors from Stanford are actually spending time in Facebook research and Google research, et cetera. So it is no longer corporate vis-a-vis -vis academic research because both are thriving. So you don't necessarily have to pursue only a PhD. Second thing is a master's level, you actually get some more depth than what you get in a BTEC. Because you get the depth, it might also prepare you even for a startup. Because sometimes, you know, for a startup, you know, it's one thing to do a startup like any other startup. You know, you make one more copy, you do something innovation that is. But if you want to create a startup that never existed, you know, now people are actually talking of uh, devices which never existed, okay? People are talking of new forms of analysis which never existed, okay? So if you want to do those things, you actually have to have a depth. Masters gives you a depth. So if you want to do a startup, it helps. The third area where you might actually find that masters actually kind of helps you is that today a lot of the R&D labs, the defense lab, the, you know, if you want to join ISRO, okay? So the chances are that you will be taken far more seriously if you have a master's because you will have some depth, which is probably kind of missing when you have only an undergraduate degree, okay? So these are, so in that sense, yes, if you are clear about doing a master's, by all means, go ahead and do it. You know, you are not limited to only pursuing a PhD, even in a corporate job, it is useful. And finally, let me also tell you, it happened to me personally. A lot of times you do your master's because you think that, look, you know, we are not sure, et cetera. But once you do your master's, you actually see where your heart is, okay? You may also change your mind and come and join us. So you will become an academic, okay? Because there is a love of academics. There is a lure of academics is so strong. So it's nice. It's nice to be a teacher and nice to be a researcher and nice to be in academics. And you may also change like me, okay? All the best. The next question. Okay, I'm not hearing you, Sujit. Okay, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, I muted sorry. it. Uh, some yeah. drum going on in the background. Uh, yeah. uh, okay, so this is from GSB Chaudhary. From uh, about 60% of UG students are doing computer science and related subjects. Yes. What are the job opportunities available in the next two, three years? Now oh. programs on AI, ML, DL, analytics are widely marketed. What yes. would be the future of these programs? I mean, okay. I, Okay, so I, I would put it in two parts. One is that, yes, a uh, lot of the new jobs for the existing companies are also in this area. So you would have already found that, you know, companies like TCS or Wipro or Infosys or even our Capgemini, et cetera. So they are actually recruiting a large number for this AI, et cetera. And if you have those skills, what is called the data skills or the digital skills, you are actually preferred. But it does not mean there are no jobs outside of this. There are enough jobs outside of this also, okay? But what is going to be important is 
okay you know any such you know in this country we normally say that one of the problems is if you open uh, one tea shop before you realize there are three more tea shops on both sides okay so there are a lot of copycats okay so the biggest problem is the copycats do not give you quality material okay so if you have a good course if you do and if you do it from a good place and you also kind of take efforts to internalize it understand it and genuinely have knowledge you will have lots and lots of stuff but there is one problem which i should be honest and tell you that because these companies are growing fast they also don't have time to evaluate who is the right person who is not the right person the hr fellows are actually using a lot of these small small consulting companies okay and they have their own ways of recruitment so quite often you might actually have the competence you may not get recruited somebody may have not have the competence he or she may get recruited because these kind of aberrations are also happening but you know whenever you have a demand supply mismatch these things are bound to happen and that is what is happening so all that i would say is don't worry too much about these things put your best effort and believe in god things will happen and then from sujit side and my side we send you some best of luck Uh, this is this is from a teacher um, yeah. uh, who uh, Geeta Ganesh uh, she uh, in the electronics and communications branch. Uh, right. Sir, many students of mine feel they lack knowledge in coding. Yes. Uh, how to quickly come to speed with coding as they have placements coming up and not many electronics companies seem to be coming for recruitments. Oh, okay. So it's it's very interesting that I tell you. that uh, okay you send me a email you will find my email uh, okay s dot sharag open at gmail dot com because i probably okay so there are enough places where you can actually kind of pick up some good skills and if they are actually electronics and communication people so you see what is happening is a lot of ece companies also look for coding so because they are likely to code maybe hardware processors etc they are likely to expect more of a c kind of a skill whereas if you are really talking of the traditional tcs infosys kind of stuff so they would possibly look for more of a java skills or a python skills okay so there are different kinds of skills and it may be difficult for a short time for a student to be able to pick up all three if they don't have any so i think they have to take a conscious call which stream they have to so first and foremost is which stream whether it is a C C plus plus kind of a stream, or a C plus plus Java kind of a stream, or more like a Python R kind of a stream, PHP kind of stream, and then once you decide on that, I think they can go to Google and find out enough number of uh, places where actually full courses are available, which even have exams, certification, everything online. Okay, it is quite easy to find. If you need something, send me a mail across. I will send you the pointers. Excellent question. Thank you. Ah, yeah, I know. Okay, Max, I think your question has been answered uh, by the professor Mohan. Mohan has a question on ethical issues associated with AI, but I think we're running out of time. Yes. Um, you uh, is there in my next slide, but we don't have time. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but professor, so what? What is your plan? I mean, after you step down in June, what happens? What, what do you plan I to do? I don't know. I don't know, but I think I have far too many friends. They won't let me be idle. <laughs> They will keep me busy, including you. <laughs> I'm sure you won't give up on me too soon, right? <laughs> no, 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 not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so it was wonderful talking to you, Professor. Great thanks. insights, a uh, lot of learning. I'm sure for all those who are look, uh, listening to this, um, and thanks a lot for being here for us. And um, we'll, I'm sure, a lot of questions today. Very interesting. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks and thank Vamshi for. I'm sorry, Vamshi, that. Uh, you know i had done what is called outsourcing of the slide movement <laughs> so what i find is sometimes you know like uh, when you do the sharing it does not happen fast so even though it is only one minute when you have 500 people waiting on the other side that one minute can be terrible yeah 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 maybe have control on it so <laughs> thanks vamshi okay then bye okay thank so you bye vamshi bye. and bye. bye to all of you yeah thank you